Good evening. My name's Alison Rose. I have the great privilege of being the principal of Newnham College, so it's my honour to welcome you here to the Catherine Seville Law Lecture this evening. We host this event in memory of alumna, fellow-in-law, lecturer and vice-principal Dr Catherine Seville, in whose name the Catherine Seville Lectureship was established. Thank you to all who gave to create this post. This lecture has been much postponed because of COVID, so it's a particular pleasure to be able to host you all here finally. Please could you switch all mobile devices to silent? Uh, the lecture itself will be recorded. Um, those of you who know about the train strike will know we've got some people who would love to be here and have asked for the recording, so we'd rather have not too many pings during the recording. But the question and answer which follows it will not be recorded. I'm delighted that our speaker is Newnham Fellow and inaugural Catherine Seville Lecturer in Law, Dr Sinead Agnew, who is also, also Catherine Seville Associate Professor in Law in the Faculty of Law. Dr Agnew studied law at Trinity College Dublin and Oxford University, history at Pembroke College Cambridge, and completed her PhD in law at the LSE. Before becoming an academic, she practiced law for almost a decade, first as a barrister in London, and subsequently as a litigation lawyer in Jersey, with a focus on civil fraud and asset tracing and offshore trust law. She now teaches the law of equity and trusts to undergraduates and advanced private law to postgraduates and is the author of two leading trusts and company law textbooks. Dr Agnew's research interests lie in the field of private law. She's particularly interested in the moral justifications for and the historical development of equitable doctrine and equitable institutions. Tonight's lecture on conscience in private law takes the theme of her current work in progress. Sinead. Over to you. Thank you, Alison. Friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests, it's a great privilege for me to be delivering the inaugural Catherine Seville Lecture this evening. When I first saw the advertisement for the Catherine Seville Lectureship in Law a few years ago, I was both moved and inspired. I was greatly moved by the idea and the story of how the post came to be endowed. The fact that so many alumni and friends of Catherine Seville, Newnham and the law faculty had come together to fund a lectureship in Catherine's name spoke volumes about the affection and esteem in which she was and indeed still is held here at Cambridge. And I was inspired by the idea of trying to honour the memory of a much-loved teacher and colleague in my daily academic work. For these reasons, the job seemed like a wonderful opportunity, and so it has proved to be. Newnham is an extraordinary community of women in which I am very proud to play a part, and the law faculty at Cambridge is a wonderful place to work. So for these reasons, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to those of you who contributed in different ways to getting the lectureship off the ground and for enabling me to be here. Although I never had the pleasure of meeting Catherine, I think of her often and her presence is still very much felt at Newnham. It feels especially fitting to be paying tribute to her today, which is in fact St. Bridget's Day, the feast day of Ireland's only female patron saint. The day has its origins in the pre-Christian festival of Imbolc, which marks the first day of spring and celebrates new life, brighter days and growth. So with that in mind, I'll turn to the theme of my lecture, conscience and private law. As Alison said, my interests lie in private law, which governs dealings between private individuals through, for example, property law and the law of contract. More specifically, I'm trying to write a book on the idea of conscience and its role in private law, and tonight I thought I'd try to give you an overview of what it's all about. So the first question you might have is, why am I doing this? Well, in legal practice, the ideas of conscience and unconscionability are regularly invoked across a wide range of private law doctrines. 
Judges at all le levels seem to be at ease with the deployment of these ideas and don't appear to regard them as causing any major difficulties. But private law is an area of law in which certainty, clarity, and predictability are prized. And so you might think it is not a natural home for fuzzy, morally laden concepts like conscience and unconscionability, which could be regarded as vague and prone to subjective interpretation. You might also worry that if judges are making decisions by reference to ideas like good conscience and unconscionability, they are likely to stray beyond the confines of their task, which is to interpret and apply the law. Instead, they may find themselves engaged in the setting of moral and social norms, which ideally is not something that they should be doing. You would not be alone in these concerns. Many academics share them. And so it follows that there's a fundamental question as to whether it's necessary and or appropriate to evoke evaluative concepts such as good conscience and unconscionability in private law at all. But it seems to me that in order to answer that question, there are some anterior questions which need to be addressed. For example, what do conscience and unconscionability mean? Can we give them a meaning that fits with the way in which private law works? Where and how are these ideas deployed in private law and what is their role? What is it that these terms can and cannot explain, i.e. what are their explanatory limits? And if possible, can we try to identify the normative concepts or themes that underpin their usage? In my book, I try to answer these questions. So your next question might be, well, what's my punchline? And why does any of this matter? And I have to confess that the book is still very much a work in progress. But that said, my ideas are as, or my views are as follows. I don't think that the ideas of conscience and unconscionability have any special legal meaning. In private law, as in life, they tend to bear their ordinary meanings. So we can see that the idea of conscience is concerned with the process of moral reasoning and is closely associated with the recognition and enforcement of certain moral duties which the law regards as having legal significance. The idea of unconscionability is concerned both with conduct and outcomes that are morally unacceptable in a way which, again, the law regards as significant. And it is also concerned with the idea of unreasonable excess, which I'll explain later, but which broadly suggests that there are normative limits to the extent of certain rights that we may have, and that affects our ability to enjoy those rights. Importantly, these ideas are not at large in private law. Rather, they tend to feature prominently in certain private law doctrines which regulate if and how we are permitted to exercise our legal rights. It seems to me that the ideas of conscience and unconscionability play an important role in these doctrines by signaling that there are good moral reasons for our rights being regulated in this way. And this is useful for several reasons. First, the idea that legal rules align with the moral principles that underpin them makes it easier for us to accept the court's conclusions and reassures us that the law is morally intelligible, thereby bolstering its authority in our eyes. And my friend and fellow conscience scholar, Irit Samet, refers to this quite neatly as moral accountability correspondence. Second, the invocation of the ideas of conscience and unconscionability in these doctrines alerts us as moral actors to the need to engage with the question of how we ought to behave when we are acquiring or seeking to exercise our legal rights. Third, the idea of unconscionability can also remind us that the law may cut down or refuse to recognize certain rights which we have freely negotiated if they disproportionately exceed what the law regards as necessary to protect our interests. All this helps us to understand that in private law, simply agreeing to create 
or having a legal right against another person is rarely the end of the story the nature of the rights we try to create and how we acquire and use them is also of normative significance in the eyes of the law and this should not be surprising if our rights are restricted for good reasons and only for good reasons this serves to strengthen the integrity of the legal doctrines from which those rights spring all that said it is important to note that the explanatory force of conscience and unconscionability in private law is limited of themselves these ideas cannot identify the normative concerns which inform the regulation or restriction of our legal rights to understand these we must interrogate the doctrines in which the ideas of conscience and unconscionability are used and if these ideas are to play the valuable role which i argue they can they must do so in a manner that is consistent with private law's need for certainty and predictability this requires the courts to respect the explanatory limits of these concepts not to use them to fudge difficult legal questions and instead to grapple directly with the difficult normative questions that underpin their usage it seems to me that if the courts engage rigorously in this exercise this can lead to better and more consistent decision making and many of the objections to the use of the idea in conscience law or the use of the idea of conscience in private law forgive me lose their sting so if i turn to the first question what the concepts of conscience and unconscionability mean can we give them a meaning that's relevant and useful in private law it helps to start i think with the etymology of conscience the roots of the word can be found in the greek and latin terms for i know or i know together with originally conscience could be understood in two senses first as a form of private knowledge and secondly as involving a community of knowledge um, with one's self perhaps or with god whereby one could bear witness to one's own acts or the acts of others now this is a fairly narrow view of conscience which, which does not necessarily involve any moral judgment but the development of conscience as a concept was strongly influenced by catholic casuistry it's a difficult word to say and in particular the work of late medieval scholastic philosophers such as st thomas aquinas this gave rise to another conception of conscience as an act of applied knowledge which has the process of moral reasoning at its core it suggests that we can combine our innate ability to identify certain basic moral truths originally thought to emanate from god with factual knowledge in order to work out what we ought to do in any given situation this idea of conscience as applied knowledge can help to explain how certain moral duties arise and bind us it presupposes that there are certain objective moral standards which we are all capable of understanding and by reference to which moral duties may arise now i appreciate that modern views may differ as to whether the idea of conscience is to be interpreted objectively or subjectively whether i just ought to do what i think i ought to do rather than what objectively i i know i am required to do but for conscience to be at all useful in a legal context it does need to be grounded in objective standards and as we shall see shortly the late scholastic idea of conscience um, which was objective was influential in the early development of law importantly the idea of conscience as applied knowledge helps us to see the moral significance of factual knowledge in the incidence and recognition of the binding nature of some moral duties for example if i find a 10 pound note between the cushions on my sofa and i remember seeing it fall out of your pocket and landing there earlier in the day we might say that my conscience is affected by the knowledge that it is your 10 pound note and this makes it reasonable to treat me as bound by a moral duty to return it or an equivalent sum to you but if i did not see it fall out of your pocket 
then unless and until I learn that it is your money which I have in my possession, it is difficult to see why my conscience should be regarded as bound by any such moral duty to you. Turning to the idea of unconscionability, this can be understood in two senses. It can describe conduct or outcomes that are morally unacceptable because they are not in accordance with what is right or reasonable. In other words, they do not conform to those objective moral standards. For example, if I threaten to expose your secrets to the Daily Mail unless you pay me £10, that would be unconscionable behaviour. Unconscionability can also describe the idea of unreasonable or immoral excess. For example, if I'm sharing a cake with friends and I take an unconscionably large slice for myself, which I have been known to do, the implication is that I've taken a greater share of the cake than that to which I am morally entitled. And it's important to note that here, the use of the term unconscionably large is not purely quantitative it also conveys the important idea that there may be limits to our moral entitlements which have normative grounds, or for which there are normative grounds, and which should not be exceeded. Note, however, that the ideas of conscience and unconscionability are both content-neutral and context-dependent. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, these concepts tell us nothing about content as a moral duty, the principle on which it is grounded, why certain conduct or a particular outcome may be morally unacceptable. Nor do they identify the parameters of our moral entitlements or the normative values by reference to which they are set. So that's a brief run through the ideas of conscience and unconscionability, which I think may be useful and relevant to private law and arise there. And the next question is, where and how are the ideas of conscience and unconscionability deployed? Now, in my view, they do not appear randomly in private law. As I said, they tend to feature most prominently in doctrines which are concerned with the regulation or restriction of our private law rights. And to understand how this works, and the relevance of these ideas to this process, I need to say a very brief word about the development of our legal system and the distinction between the common law and equity in this jurisdiction. Historically, law was administered by the common law courts, and in the very early days of the common law, there were certain ways in which claims had to be pleaded and proved, and if your claim did not fall within these parameters, it would fail. This often resulted in injustice to litigants, and so the practice developed of petitioning the King and Council for a remedy where justice demanded that it be granted, but it was unavailable in the common law courts. These petitions were dealt with by the Lord Chancellor and subsequently the Court of Chancery, and the body of principles which the Court of Chancery developed and applied to determine these claims became known as equity. Now, in addition to granting remedies which were unavailable at common law, equity would also sometimes intervene to regulate the strict exercise by one party of her common law rights where this was necessary to prevent an injustice to the other party. Now, the two parallel court systems were unified in the late 19th century, but there remains an important intellectual distinction between equity and the common law, so it was said. Writers like Frederick Maitland, Henry Smith, and Ben McFarlane have argued that equity works as a secondary parasitic system of principles, which tends to um, regulate the way in which we exercise our primary common law rights. And the ideas of conscience and unconscionability have long been associated with equity, stretching back centuries. As Mike McNair has pointed out, the idea of conscience in the narrow sense, as meaning private knowledge, was relevant to the procedural distinction between the early equitable and common law jurisdictions. This was because equity admitted proof of private knowledge of facts and subjective intentions, which could not be proved so easily 
if at all, at common law. The work of scholars like Dennis Klink and Richard Headland suggests that the scholastic idea of conscience, which was based on natural law ideals um, and Catholic casuistry, there's that word again, and which invoked objective moral standards uh, and focused on moral reasoning, was substantively influential in the development of equity during the late medieval and early modern periods. This is unsurprising. In circumstances where the Lord Chancellor and subsequently the Court of Chancery were intervening to grant relief, which was not available at common law, or which modified the exercise of common law rights, that intervention had to be justified by reference to something other than common law principles. And so the idea of good conscience was frequently invoked by equity to justify its intervention. Now, over time, as the Court of Chancery laid down case law, the idea of conscience became less evaluative, more secularised, and firmly grounded in equitable doctrine. It's also important to note that the idea of good conscience is not exclusively associated with equity. Work, which I think is often overlooked by scholars such as Norman Doe, shows so the work of Norman Doe, which is often overlooked, I think, sorry, shows that the late scholastic idea of conscience was also influential in the early substantive development of the common law. And this connection is not often brought out. It's also important to note that the regulation of our common law rights is not a task exclusively undertaken by equity. The common law does it too in certain limited circumstances. So for these reasons, um, the ideas of conscience and unconscionability are relevant to both equitable and common law doctrines which regulate and restrict the exercise of our private law rights. And what I'm going to do in the rest of the lecture is take you through four examples of these doctrines in the hope that I can illustrate how my remaining questions about explanatory limits and underlying normative concerns might pan out and to make some suggestions in this regard. Now there's much more to say about these examples than I can possibly discuss here, but hopefully they'll encourage you to buy the book. <laughs> the first example which I'm going to talk about highlights the relevance of conscience as applied knowledge in the creation of equitable duties. Now, equity may recognise that I have a specific common law right, but impose a positive duty on me as to how I must exercise or use that right. We can see this clearly in the law of trusts and in the related doctrine of knowing receipt. At its simplest, a trust relationship arises where one person holds a right, which is usually a property right to certain assets, subject to a duty not to use that right for their own benefit, usually, or not exclusively for their own benefit, but to hold it for the benefit of someone else. Now, there's a close connection between the idea of conscience and trustees' duties because these were initially regarded as binding in morality only. The common law did not recognise them, although they subsequently came to be recognised and enforced by equity. And it is said that the equitable jurisdiction to enforce trusts depends on the conscience of the holder of legal title to the property being affected by knowledge of certain relevant facts which require her to hold her right to the assets, not for herself or not exclusively for herself, but for the benefit of someone else. Now, I think that here we can see the idea of conscience as applied knowledge at work. Unless the putative trustee's conscience is affected by factual knowledge so that she can work out what she ought to do with the assets, it is unreasonable to treat her conscience as bound by any enforceable equitable duty in respect of those assets. Thus, knowledge of the relevant facts is both morally and legally significant. It is a necessary precondition 
for the, the recognition and enforcement of trustees' duties. And these duties <coughs> come in different kinds. However, the idea of conscience per se cannot tell us what principles underpin trust obligations, what the content of a specific trust obligation is, or what or how much an individual must know before she is bound by such an obligation. If you ask me to act as trustee of some asset, and I expressly agree, my knowledge of the terms of the trust is implicit in my acceptance of them, and I will then be bound by all the duties which the trust instrument imposes on me, and these will usually include active asset management duties. But sometimes, equity may just impose the basic custodial duty of trusteeship on someone, even though she never intended to become a trustee or agreed to do so. So let's say I've agreed to hold assets as an express trustee for you, but in breach of trust, in breach of my duties, I transfer legal title to those assets to someone else, say, Alison. Now, if, while Alison has the assets, her conscience is affected by knowledge that they were transferred to her in breach of trust, she comes under an immediate and continuing equitable duty not to retain them for her own benefit, but to restore them, or failing that, their current value, for your benefit. This is referred to as the doctrine of knowing receipt. And the test for its operation is said to turn on whether Alison had such knowledge as would render it unconscionable for her to retain the benefit of the receipt. However, the explanatory force of unconscionability in knowing receipt is pretty limited. For example, although it indicates that Alison's knowledge is key to the incidence of her duty, it cannot tell us precisely what facts she must know or how much knowledge she really needs to have for her conscience to be bound by that duty. Must she actually know, really know, that the property was transferred to her in breach of trust? Or is it sufficient that she has good reason to know this, and really ought to know it, because she would have discovered it if she dug a little deeper and asked some appropriate questions? The courts have given different answers to this question, and it remains unresolved. Nevertheless, the underlying moral concern is reasonably clear. Very broadly, for the benefit of my legal colleague, we might refer to it as a concern to prevent the unconsci unconscientious retention of the benefit conferred by a legal right. Here, equity is imposing a duty to restrict Alison in the exercise of her legal right to enjoy the benefit which she has received, but to which she is not morally entitled. So that's the first example of how the idea of conscience can be um, central, the idea of conscience as applied knowledge can be central to the incidence of equitable duties. Moving on to our next example, instead of imposing a duty on me as to how I exercise a specific legal right. Sometimes equity or the common law will subject me to a liability or regard me as being under a liability, which restricts me or restrains me from exercising that right in a particular way because of the manner in which I acquired it. These are known as defective transfers. Here we are concerned with the situation in which I confer a benefit on you under a contract or by making a non-contractual payment to you. However, for a specific reason pertaining at the time of the contract or, uh, or the payment, I cannot be said to have properly intended that you should enjoy the benefit of the right I've transferred. In such a case, in principle, I am permitted to reverse the transfer by unravelling the contract, if we can both be restored to our original positions, or by calling on you to make restitution of the value of the non-contractual payment. And you come under a corresponding liability to me, which restricts your ability to insist on the, the exercise of your legal right to the benefit which was transferred. <coughs> 
So to take an example, let's say we are in a relationship where you have influence over me because I'm elderly, you are my carer, and you help me to manage my financial affairs. If I make a transfer to you which is disadvantageous to me, proof of the relationship of influence gives rise to a presumption that you unduly influence my decision to make that transfer. And equity will pre permit me to reverse it if I wish to do so, unless you can rebut the presumption of undue influence for example, by showing that I had independent legal advice before I entered into the transaction with you. And even if we're not in a relationship where influence is presumed, you might exert undue influence on me by applying direct acts of pressure, dominance, or coercion, if there are cases to that effect. Now, the language of unconscionability appears frequently in the doctrine of undue influence, to indicate that there are good reasons why equity would intervene to restrict you in the exercise of your legal rights against me. But again, its explanatory force is quite limited. It cannot tell us what those reasons are. So we have to look at the doctrine carefully to see what's going on. And we can see that the courts use the language of unconscionability in various ways to refer to your moral fault in failing to ensure that I got independent advice and freely consented to the transaction. Or in other examples, you're to indicate that you were morally at fault by exploiting your influence over me in some way. Or again, to indicate that the transaction disadvantages me so excessively that it shocks the conscience of the court. Now the use of the language of unconscionability in this way, I think highlights three underlying normative or moral concerns which may make it unacceptable for you to enforce your legal right against me. These are, first, the need to protect the integrity of my consent to the transaction or my intention to make the transfer. Now, this does not necessarily require you to be behaving badly towards me at the time of the transfer, it is just sufficient really that the relationship of influence between us affected my decision making. Secondly, we can perceive that there may be a concern to uh, prevent you from wrongfully exploiting your influence or your dominance over me. Now this does tend to indicate a need for some wrongful conduct by you at the time of the transaction. And thirdly, we can see a concern to, um, uh, to um, protect me from transactions which are substantively unfair because they really cause me disadvantage. Now, the idea of unconscionability does not help us to choose between these normative concerns or possible rationales for undue influence or to, um, to tell us which one is really the right answer. And as um, a contract law scholar, Mindy Chen Wishart has argued, it may simply be that the best analysis is that all three concerns are in play in this doctrine. So that's an example of where um, equity may restrict you in the exercise of your legal rights by reason of the way in which that legal right was acquired or circumstances and relevant reasons pertaining to that. The next example I want to talk about is a situation where equity may impose a liability that restricts me from exercising my common law rights even if there was no problem with the way in which I acquired them and I'm holding perfectly valid, perfectly legitimately acquired rights. And I think this can be demonstrated by reference to the doctrine of proprietary estoppel. Let's say I own a farm and I make informal assurances to you that I will grant you an interest in the farm, intending those assurances to be capable of being relied on by you. Now there's no formal contract between us, just informal discussions and promises, but you 
reasonably rely on those assurances to your detriment by spending years working on the farm for reduced wages and you give up other opportunities that you could have pursued. Now imagine that I subsequently refuse to honour my promise or assurance and I insist on enforcing strictly my legal right of ownership to the farm to deny that you have any interest in it. In these circumstances, equity may again step in and say it would now be unconscionable for me to go back on my word. Now, note that the idea of unconscionability does not tell us here why it would be morally unacceptable in a way that is legally significant for me to resile from the assurance, nor does it really direct us towards the appropriate remedial response. However, it's important to note that equity is generally disinclined to enforce acts of generosity. So there needs to be a specific reason, in addition to my promise or assurance, for it to grant relief to you. And this reason may be found in the requirement of detrimental reliance by you, which is necessary for the estoppel to arise. And as Ben McFarlane has suggested, the need for your detrimental reliance to be proved before relief will be granted, or in order that relief can be granted, suggests that I was never under any pre-existing equitable duty to honour my assurance to you. I may have made a promise, but it was not a promise that was immediately enforceable at common law because there was no contract, or in equity because it will only equity will only grant a relief if there is detrimental reliance. So rather, we can see here that equity is simply imposing a liability which restricts me in the exercise of my legal rights. And this means that even though I may have been under a moral duty to honour my assurances or my promises to you, and I'm, I have or I'm about to breach that duty, that breach only becomes unconscionable in a legally significant sense in light of what has happened since those assurances were made. And even then, a question arises as to how best to remedy that unconscionability if it has arisen. Should we assume that the starting point is that the court should try to give effect to my promise or its monetary equivalent? Or is it better to start from the position that the remedy should be limited to what is necessary to address any reliance-based harm which you would now suffer if I were permitted to go back on my word? Now, this question has been hotly debated, most recently by the Supreme Court in a 100-page judgment, where by a very narrow majority the court went for the first option. It acknowledged, however, that the court may exercise its discretion to limit the remedy in certain circumstances, where, for example, enforcing the promise would be out of all proportion to the, um, the detriment which you have suffered. And it said a lot of other things about remedies, which I can't really get into now. But I want to finish this example by postulating that the underlying moral concern which seems to underpin the court's willingness to prevent me from fully enforcing my legal rights against you may be to give effect as far as is reasonable and possible to my voluntary assumption of responsibility towards you by making that promise. But if and only if that is coupled with detrimental reliance on your part. Finally, the last example concerns the circumstances where the law may say that even though you and I have agreed that I should have a specific right against you, that right is void or unenforceable because it exceeds the interest which it, which it is designed to protect. And a good example of this is to be found in the common law doctrine of relief against penalties. Now, we may enter into a contract which includes a term that if I breach one of my primary duties to you under the contract, I come under a sort of remedial duty to pay a fixed sum to you, and we agree what that sum is going to be. 
Now, these are known as agreed or liquidated damages clauses. You may think that as we freely negotiated with all our faculties, there's no undue influence, everything's going well, and we freely agreed that that fixed sum should be payable if I breach my duty, we might think that that clause should be valid and enforceable, come what may. However, the common law says that the validity of the, that clause depends on whether the fixed sum payable on breach by me is exorbitant or unconscionable by reference to your legitimate interest in having me perform the contract. If the sum payable is exorbitant or unconscionable in this way, the clause is regarded as imposing a penalty on me and the common law treats it as void, as being against public policy. So what is the idea of unconscionability doing here? Well, I think it's, it's pointing to the fact that the clause must not grant you a right which disproportionately exceeds what is necessary to project, protect your legitimate interest in performance. But that doesn't tell us very much, right? The idea of unconscionability can't tell us what counts as a legitimate interest, when the agreed sum will disproportionately exceed it, and by reference to which norm this judgment is made. However, the cases suggest that the normative concern which animates the court's response to penalties relates to the need to preserve the integrity and the supremacy of contract laws damages regime, so contract laws remedial regime. And to understand this, it's important to note that contract law does not force people to perform their bargains. It accepts that I may breach my contractual duties and usually it seeks to protect your performance interest by ordering me to pay you damages for your loss. And these damages are designed to try to put you in the position you would have been in if I had held up my end of the bargain. This means that an agreed damages clause will usually be treated as a penalty if it disproportionately exceeds the damages for loss to which you would be entitled in the event of my breach. However, the cases also say that exceptionally you may have a legitimate interest in performance which cannot be met by such a damages award. So imagine that I'm an employee in your new business and the value of the goodwill of that business significantly depends on my continued loyalty and connection to it for a minimum period. If I breach my duties to you by leaving early and going off to work somewhere else, the risk is that your business may be worth much less in a way that is difficult to measure and which may not be adequately remedied by an award of contractual damages which are limited by the rules on causation, remoteness of damage and um, the need for losses to be mitigated. Now in these circumstances, even if the sum payable by me to you under the agreed damages clause greatly <coughs> exceeds your entitlement to common law damages, the clause will still be valid as long as it is not disproportionate to the le legitimate commercial interest in my performance which you are trying to protect because that, that goes beyond what damages can offer you. And it seems to me that in this way, save in these exceptional circumstances, the penalties doctrine prevents people from contracting out of their remedial entitlements which are measured by reference to the normative parameters of contract law itself. So this is an interesting example of where what's morally acceptable, to, or to understand what's morally acceptable, we're not looking at external moral standards, we're actually looking at um, internal standards which are peculiar, or internal normative parameters which are peculiar to contract law itself. So to conclude, and I think I'm just about in time. The themes and normative concerns which I've identified in these four, example, four examples as closely associated with the ideas of conscience and unconscionability appear in other doctrines too. Other doctrines which impose duties or liabilities that regulate the existence of our private law rights and which I also explore in detail in the book. So, for example, 
the idea of conscience as applied knowledge is relevant to the incident and enforcement of other equitable duties, such as the duty of confidence. The concern to prevent unconscientious retention appears not only in the context of knowing receipt, but also in doctrines which impose liabilities that respond to unilateral mistakes. The concern to protect the integrity of contractual consent is apparent in all cases of defective transfers. And the concern to protect or to prevent, sorry, deliberately exploitative conduct in the acquisition of legal rights, which we encountered in the context of undue influence, also appears in the equitable doctrine of unconscionable bargains, and I think probably also in the common law doctrine of lawful act duress. The concern to prevent people from exercising their legal rights in a way that unconscionably exceeds what is necessary to protect the interests which those rights are intended to or designed to protect can also be seen not just in the penalties doctrine but in the equitable doctrine of relief against forfeiture. And finally, the concern I identified in proprietary estoppel about assumptions of responsibility and the need to prevent reliance-based harm that flow, may flow from them is apparent not only in cases of equitable and common law estoppel but also, for example, in slightly different ways in the liability that arises in response to misrepresentation and the custodial duty or the way in which a custodial duty may arise under certain doctrines relating to non-express trusts. So, it seems to me that it's possible to identify recurring broad normative concerns which underpin the invocation of conscience and unconscionability in private law. If we pay careful attention to the explanatory limits of these ideas and try to address the difficult questions as to how the underlying normative concerns play out in different contexts, I think we can get much closer to a clear understanding of the meaning and significance of conscience in private law. And if we have the benefit of that understanding, which I'm hoping to provide, it seems to me that the idea of conscience can play a valuable role in private law, as I indicated at the beginning of this lecture, which does not conflict with the private law's ideals of certainty, clarity, and predictability. <laughs>